Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. Welcome to the third day of, of the Open Expo virtual experience. We are really happy to have you here. I hope you have enjoyed the two prior days, and now we are going to New Year, dear. You know, you can chat in your tables and you can do networking. But now we are going to start with the first speaker. Let me introduce you to Kevin McRae. He loves open source and cybersecurity. He's written for three years for the Open Expo ebook. And here's Kevin McGrell, and he's talk about using open source software to solve cybersecurity issues. Welcome, Kevin. You can come to stage. Hello, Kevin. We cannot hear you now. Now you can hear me. All right, good. Thank you, Emma. I appreciate that a lot. Uh, great introduction and really happy to be here. Proud to be the first speaker of the day and whatnot. So uh, let's go ahead and see if we can uh, get my slides to show. Um, so give me a second. Okay. Perfect. So for everyone, remember that if you want to ask any question, you can do it in the Q&A. You can write your question or you can also raise your hand and then we can invite you to the stage and you can talk here with us. Excellent. So welcome, Kevin. All and right. Can you guys see my slides okay? Yes. Excellent. All right. Well, today's talk, is, as she said, is about using open source software to solve cybersecurity issues. Uh, this is a lot of what I do for a living. So. I work at a company called InfraShield, where I'm a fully badged cybersecurity expert. Uh, but over the years, uh, I've uh, been known more as CAM, which are my initials. So uh, this anti-spam, uh, uh, when I do anti-spam work, I find it's a little bit of an inside joke. This is a Canadian off-brand spam called CAM. That's my initials that I love to use. So if you want to hook up with me on uh, LinkedIn, you can find me uh, with that URL. But you'll notice the can of uh, CAM, and uh, that will make sure you found the right profile. But a little bit about me and my security expertise. So a uh, very proud member of Apache Spam Assassin. I've been working in the anti-spam and the email security world since I started an ISP back in 1996. And by, you know, really 1998, spam was overwhelming things. Uh, I'm also the principal author of cam.cf, which I'm proud to say protects hundreds of millions of email boxes. Uh, I helped with the first intrusion detection system that was ever built, mostly uh, helping pick the hardware to make it fast enough to actually do real-time monitoring of the system, uh, later bought by Cisco. Uh, I also work on Mime Defang now, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that more. And also in my older days, uh, you know, I had my phone lines cut before I was uh, double digits old at my parents' house and eventually got an ap apology letter from the FBI. Uh, and that's when my race car team decided to fill my, uh, or actually my staff filled my room with penguins uh, that were inflatable. And uh, they also uh, put uh, FBI approved across my race car. So I'll tell one story and then I'll get started. So this is one of my favorite pictures of my old company. That's our logo on the hood of the race car. Uh, the driver was fine, but uh, he blew the engine coming out of a, uh, a turn and it dumped oil all over the engine. And this guy took the picture and it was an amazing picture. I loved it. And, uh, but it was taken in the middle of the day. So you can see how bright that flame is because it blacked out everything else in this picture and we had to overdevelop it to even find anything. And I told the driver that he had to go do it again because we didn't get the logo on perfectly straight. So anyway, that's my little bit of humor for the day. So uh, tone setters, uh, this is, anytime I'm giving a cybersecurity talk, I like to make sure that um, I set the tone correctly. Uh, you know, I will use humor. I will talk about my history. I will talk about things, but I am very, very serious about what I do. You know, I do deal with things like uh, uh, mitigation and incident response and things where people are literally calling and crying on the phone because, you know, they've just had a major issue, uh, perhaps a very, very bad financial issue occur or something else. Um, and so, uh, you know, I am very serious. I try and use humor for it. And as part of that, you know, I do tell people XKCD is one of my favorite websites. It's a great source of knowledge and humor. Um, one of the best comic strips around there. It's similar in vain to Dilbert or the IT crowd are other great uh, places for uh, humor and IT and whatnot. But I can really highly recommend XKCD. Additionally, um, when I talk about cybersecurity, uh, I don't know if anybody there can talk, but uh, you know, it includes two different types of, of uh, cybersecurity. The first one is information technology, which is IT technology. Uh, that's what most people think of when they think of cyber. That's your things like your firewalls, your antivirus, things like that. However, there's another type of cybersecurity, which is operational technology. And at my day job at InfraShield, what we do is uh, we define operational technology as anything that touches the physical world. So 
um, your Google Homes, your Nest thermostats, your industrial control systems, your uh, building access systems and turnstiles, things like that. They can open a door or turn on a furnace or, um, you know, allow someone access to a garage, things like that. Those are operational technology. And a lot of the risks that we see in cyber are coming from uh, the conversion of the two. People are starting to take operational technology and connect it to their IT so they can do things like talk to their Google Home and tell it to unlock a door. Uh, that became a problem because people would walk up to doors and shout, uh, you know, okay, Google, unlock the front door. And it would unlock doors. So they, their fix was to make it so it could only lock doors. It couldn't unlock the doors. Uh, but, you know, similar problems with uh, garage door openers, things like that, that allow physical access to rooms, just to mention some simplistic uh, examples. So anyway, um, another thing that we go through a lot when we're doing cybersecurity is what's known as the CIA triad. And what this stands for is confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And depending on your system, they, you have to balance which of these three are important, which is why it's normally viewed as a triangle. And the triangle can be pivoted so that maybe one item is important or two of the three are important. So a good example is if you're doing a public website, at that point, confidentiality is not important at all. You know, you're already publishing the information publicly. So confidentiality is not a concern. However, you want integrity. You don't want people to be able to deface your website. That would be very bad. And you want your website up and running, but maybe you don't need to be up and running, you know, 100% of the time because, you know, your normal business that runs during business hours. So you can have downtime during the weekend. So availability may not be that important. So in that case, integrity would be the, the, the key of the three that you'd be worried about. Uh, but, you know, you can go through other systems where, you know, if you have confidential patient records, confidentiality might be the most important. Availability might be the least important and integrity is the second most important. Um, but, you know, as the joke here writes, you know, the only secure computer is one that's unplugged, locked in a safe, I've heard buried in concrete, et cetera, uh, with no wires to it. Uh, but, you know, there's a joke, you know, at that point, you failed availability, you know, you've only maintained the confidentiality and the integrity. So when you when you do these things, you do have to think about um, balancing your specific Hello everyone and sorry for the inconvenience. Kevin is back. Welcome here to the stage, Kevin. Hello, Kevin. Hi, hello, Kevin. Hello. All right. Well, I hope it uh, I hope it was the platform. I was talking along and then I noticed the uh, green light on my camera went off and I was not sure if I was still broadcasting or not, but I will uh, uh, do yeah. I need to start over? Or did did you guys get through a certain number of my talk? I think we can continue. Maybe the last sentence or something, just in case we miss the last part. Okay. Um, okay, so I go down and you can continue. Yes. All right. Thank you. All right. Hello again, everybody. So um, where I was, was I was talking about Apache IoT DB. Uh, Apache IoT DB is a time series database that's designed to store timestamp database and handle really the entire life cycle of the product. Because, you know, one of the things I was talking about, which I hope didn't get lost in the recording, is um, that when you're dealing with a lot of data from, you know, different sources, Amazon, Azure, or industrial data, in this particular case, you know, meteorological manufacturing enterprise data or lots and lots of systems up on the cloud, um, you can generate a lot of data. And um, with that, you get a lot of things that need to happen. So for example, you want to be able to deal with a lot of data very quickly, millions and millions of points of data per second. You also want to have um, lots and lots of devices. In this case, Apache IoT DB can handle tens of millions of different time series. Um, you want to be able to query the data without waiting. Um, you know, if the database is locked while it's ingesting data and you're just receiving millions and millions of data points, you could wait for a long time to be able to get a query to, to happen. Uh, additionally, you want to be able to have uh, a lot of features revolving around, you know, things like visualization and be able to do things that are time series based. Um, and you want to use it with existing e ecosystems. As I mentioned here, Kafka, MATLAB, et cetera, are very, very important. 
Uh, but probably one of the most important things is really the life cycle of the data. So in this particular case, what, what I mean by that is, uh, and we'll talk about some of the deficiencies in other products, uh, but you know, when you're logging data, it's only going to be valuable if you're able to retrieve those logs and analyze them. So in the system of a, a wind farm, which was the example we gave earlier, uh, one of the reasons that I got involved with Apache IoTDB was because we were doing data, we wanted to do analysis, and we actually had a weather event. And I was asked to basically say, we have another expected weather event at a uh, locality, uh, similar to what happened on that day uh, previously. And I said, great, let's look at the logs from February 17th. And you know that was the particular day, let's see what happened. And they said, we can't, we can't do that. We can only store the logs for 30 days. So life cycle of data is very, very important. And Apache IoTDB has some great features around that. Um, I've given other talks about IoTDB, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, that'll be in the thanks or the towards the end where you can get that data. So if you wanna find out more about Apache IoTDB, um, you can find out more about that. Uh, but Apache IoTDB uh, builds on top of the Hadoop uh, distributed file system. Uh, so it can scale hugely. And uh, for those of you who don't know, I don't know how interactive I can be on this platform, but if you're out there, feel free to speak up. Um, you know, really the, the, the first thing is what's in a name. So Apache Hadoop is named after the stuffed animal of uh, one of Doug Cutting's kids. And uh, you know, that yellow elephant uh, was named Hadoop and the rest is history. So engineers are really bad at naming things. Don't get me started. Um, and additionally, you know, the, the reason it was called big data really had to do with the fact that elephants are big and they live in the big top at the circus. Uh, so that's really where it came from. It really didn't have too much to do with the concept that, you know, the data was, you know, large in size. Um, though that certainly was a double entendre. So <clears throat> from Wikipedia, their database uh, or their definition, excuse me, of big data uh, is here is data sets that are so voluminous and complex that traditional data software uh, data processing applications uh, are inadequate. And, uh, you know, at Apache Software Foundation, we have 48 projects under big data. So I encourage you to look at that. We'll talk a little bit about Apache Software Foundation later on. Um, but the next product under logging, also an Apache project, is Apache Metron. Apache Metron is a cybersecurity application framework to detect anomalies. That's the, the fancy, quick way to say it. But what it can do is it can take your logs from many different sources, it can ingest them, uh, it can parse them, it can take in other intel and intelligence data and add it to that, uh, those uh, log files that you've ingested. It can build a profile of that data that's nice and clean. It can then decide whether or not you need to receive alerts and it can index the data so that you can um, search it and, and explore and visualize it. Uh, that data is also built on top of Apache Hadoop so it's stored there. Uh, but, you know, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, they only shore, store things for a shorter period of time, usually about 30 days in Apache Solar uh, for visualization and insight. So this would be a key system that we look to augment with Apache IoT DB and other visualization tools so that we can keep a real time look and run our, uh, uh, our security operations center, our SOC, uh, built on something like Apache Metron. But then we also have the ability to do historical research and store a lot of data and ingest it with um, Apache IoTDB, which has other special features. But uh, the key reason people ask me is why is logging so important? And the big thing is, is just that uh, the, the number one answer I give is I wanna know about a problem before a customer. I don't want a person who's a customer ever calling me and saying, hey, are you aware this system's down? And we don't know about it. So we want to know a system's down. We want to know it's compromised. We want to be able to find out whether or not there's a, a problem with something, uh, predictive failures, things like that uh, can be very, very easily uh, identified when you have logs. If you don't have logs, you, you're you really, really behind the curve and you will have a lot of problems trying to resolve these types of issues. All right, next thing, uh, not an Apache project um, and it's called the Elk Stack. The reason it's called the Elk Stack is actually because it's three products. Um, and in fact, I often joke that it should be called the Lex Stack because it really started with Elasticsearch that's, and then built from there. But basically in an Elk Stack, you use a product from, um, what is the name? The Elastic.co is the name of the company that, uh, that invented this. It's, these three products are all open source. And uh, you know, similar to Apache Metron, you've got kind of a process that you go through. 
So log stash to ingest the data and then elastic search to store the data. And then finally Kibana to visualize the data. So a couple of examples. So uh, for example, we use some open source software that is able to parse the DMARC reports in the email security. It's able to put those up on a nice dashboard and visualize it with Kibana very, very quickly. Uh, with this, it becomes interactive. You can click on it. In this particular case, you know, we were able to find out that a customer accidentally was using Action Network. They sent out 14,419 emails during this period of time, which I guess was November to March for this particular graph. Uh, you can see the three spikes uh, that largely represent that data, at which point all 14,000 messages were marked as spam because um, they failed their DMARC tests because they failed to uh, update their records to allow for Action Network as a vendor that they use. Additionally, you can see similar things. So you can do uh, DNS examples along with uh, GOIP uh, data. You can do uh, MySQL and uh, look at specific queries and what your servers look like and whether you're getting aborted connections and how many connections you have during the day. So if you have peaks, you could find out whether or not you need to tweak your MySQL server, for example. Uh, and then finally, similarly with uh, HTTPD. So with this, you could find out whether or not your servers are overloaded, things like that. Or, uh, and a lot of times these type of peaks might show an attack. So uh, can't really do too much interactive. Uh, let's see, can anybody in the chat, uh, let's see. Um, can anybody in the chat uh, tell me what's the name of the first all electronic computer? Or you can do it in QA. All right, well, I don't have any chats that I can see, um, but uh, the answer is uh, ENIAC. So that would stood for Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer. And a neat little fact from that is um, during that computer, which used to run on vacuum tubes, every vacuum tube was a, basically the equivalent of a single transistor, a single on-off bit switch. Um, one of the vacuum tubes had a physical bug like a fly, and uh, that caused that particular vacuum tube not to work correctly. Uh, and that is where the term, uh, you know, a bug comes from, was a physical bug in a vacuum tube. All right, so the number two thing that we talk about is gonna come under the category of email security. Uh, that's where I love uh, working. That's where I've done a lot of work for years. And in that particular category, what we've got, let's see how we're doing on time. Okay, 10.30, so we're coming up to 10.26. So uh, the first one is Apache Spam Assassin. Apache Spam Assassin is a very mature product. It's very, very good, um, and I love it. And it's also very future-proof because it's a scoring framework at its heart to uh, analyze email and score it. So with that, you can develop more tests uh, and add them into the framework and just continue using the same scoring framework. Almost every commercial product out there um, you know, and commercial platform uses the scoring system that was developed by Apache Spam Assassin. Uh, because it just works and it stops spam and whatnot. I won't talk about the rest of the stuff on the slide. Uh, but for the second thing is Mime to Fang. Uh, so Mime to Fang is a framework for using what is called a Milter interface with SendMail. That's an API where you can talk to email and basically I call it wiretapping. So while the email communication is happening from one server to the other uh, or one machine to another, um, you can do things at each stage. Uh, Mime to Fang provides a mechanism for that particular um, wiretapping, and you, have, you can develop policies for each of the stages of the wiretap. So when the initial connection happens, or the hello, or the checking the recipients, or checking the sender, uh, checking the IP address of the sender, and things like that, uh, you can do it. So what we call midstream commands on SMTP. Um, and Postfix is another SMTP uh, server that, you, that implements um, the Milter interface as well. All right. In addition to Mime Defang and a bit of a announcement today, I've never publicly uh, announced this yet, but the McGrail Foundation, uh, which I helped found, uh, we provide services and really try and help for private and secure businesses and communications. Uh, Mime Defang has been donated by App River and Zix to the McGrail Foundation for uh, its future development and uh, management. Uh, additionally, on the McGrail Foundation, you'll find cam.cf that I referred to earlier. Uh, as well as much more. Uh, very proud of the work that we're doing there and, and hope to continue it for a long time to come. Uh, which reminds me, um, 
uh, I, you know, the Apache Software Foundation. So many people have heard of the Apache Software Foundation, but equally many people have not. Uh, we're, we just turned, uh, I think, 21 years old recently, but in that 20 years, uh, open source software has pretty much changed the way the world computes. Um, what we are, we're a, in the U.S., we're a 501c3 charity. That, that means that we're completely nonprofit and we're considered a charity. Uh, we're not a trade organization. And what most people equate when they think of Apache, they think immediately of our granddaddy project, which is HTTP, and they think of the Apache software license. So, uh, but at the ASF, we, our mission is to provide software for the public good, and we do so at no charge. And that's very, very important to what we do. Uh, we support a lot of programs, um, and we also support our license. You don't have to be a member of the foundation or a project under the foundation to use our license. And I typically recommend anybody looking at open source and not sure what license they want to use, start with ASL v2. It's very permissive, it's very business friendly, um, and it helps a lot with patent grants and has provisions in there. And it also is not copyleft. And if you don't know what copyleft is, that would be a great reason to use ASL v2. And you can decide later on whether or not copyleft is something you want to do. But it's great license, highly recommend it. It's my favorite license. But you might be wondering why we also have the McGrail Foundation, why Mind Defang was donated there rather than the Apache Software Foundation, is the McGrail Foundation will deal with products that are licensed under other open source licenses that would never be eligible to come underneath the Apache Software Foundation's umbrella. So that's how we do it. But when I'm talking about Apache, one of some of the things I like to tell people is that 80% of the world's software websites use their software. Every smartphone in the world uses uh, our software and every plane in U.S. airspace is tracked with our software. So we're very intrinsic to the way the world works and computes, uh, but we're fine being uh, intrinsic and somewhat behind the scenes when we do it. Uh, if you want to know more about the projects, there are uh, about 387 current open source initiatives underneath our umbrella. And if you go to projects.apache.org, you can see uh, all of them. Additionally, the incubator is how we bring in new projects. I'm proud to be a mentor there and a member of the uh, what's called the Incubator Project Management Committee, where we oversee currently 43 podlings that we're doing. Uh, and it's a great place to learn more. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, there's almost 50 big data projects. We talked about Hadoop, Metron, Spam Assassin, et cetera, uh, that all fall under this, as well as many of the visualization tools uh, will help you as well. And my final topic, and I know I probably don't have much time, it's really kind of a tie. So I wanted to kind of mention open source distributions. So in cybersecurity, when dealing with open source, there are two that really stand out for me. The first is Kali. Kali is a, uh, a Linux distribution, ideally for uh, what's called offensive security. So doing penetration tests. And uh, offensive security is very important to finding out whether or not your own servers are uh, exploitable. Additionally, when you're dealing with things like cyber ranges, which is where you can practice your skills in a safe manner where you won't end up with police forces knocking on your door asking you why you're hacking something. Uh, one of the things that I love is Raspberry Pis that you can get very inexpensively. And uh, you know the key operating system that I love running on them is Raspbian, now known as Raspberry Pi OS. It's a Debian-based operating system uh, with uh, you know customization for the Raspberry Pi. With that, you can run things like Apache IoT DB on that small device, monitor sensors on uh, that uh, IoT devices, and then log that and push it upstream over cellular, over a network, or even offline by gathering the SD cards and getting what's called a TS file from Apache IoT DB, ingesting it into your IoT DB server, and using that for analysis. So, highly recommend those. So, at that point, we're pretty much here. I could talk for hours about many of these topics, but uh, I don't have that time. In fact, I think right now, yeah, we're over the time when I should start Q&A. But uh, so please, if you want to start typing in the Q&A or the chat uh, your questions, I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, but one of the things I wanted to mention is there is mcgrail.com slash downloads. There are some of the things that I re referred to. So for example, I gave a talk last year at Pearl Conference about fighting spam with Perl using Apache Spam Assassin and Lime Defang. So if you want to know more of an introduction to those two products, you can find that there. Uh, if you're interested in doing more with offensive cyber and you want to learn about uh, how to build your own cyber range fairly inexpensively, I gave a talk at Thunder Bay uh, Google Developer Group about that. 
you can find the exact shopping list in that uh, presentation there that I recommend. Uh, for less than $600, at least pre-pandemic uh, US dollars, you can build a cyber range that will get you very, very far on learning a lot about cybersecurity. And then finally, many, many other tools to help you as an administrator uh, kind of get to the next level. Uh, I called it my Linux, uh, Linux system Swiss Army tools for administrators was a speech I gave at WebPro's uh, summit last year. Um, we're also working on an open source curriculum for cybersecurity. So if you keep a watch on mcgrail.com, uh, we'll hopefully have that up published very soon. So with that, I will say thank you. Uh, many people helped with this, but I will call out in particular um, the slides from the IOTDB that they allowed me to borrow as well as uh, Giovanni and Georgia from PCC that helped me with the Kibana visualizations that we decided to show in here. So um, anyway, I thank many, many open source projects, especially the Apache Software Foundation uh, that I love and their efforts uh, in the way, changing the way we compute, as uh, I said. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and we will see if we have any particular Q&A. Thank you very much, Kevin. Absolutely. Really nice. If someone has a question, you. you remember that you can write it down in the Q&A, or you can also raise your hand and we can have you here on the stage. You can do this to Kevin. But it's more, we have you here with us. We open more arms to you. Absolutely. Well, while we wait for some people to talk, I can, I can uh, tell you, I wore my shirt for you, which is my oh, Apache hockey nice. shirt. So, uh, you know, I was going to wear a uh, Real Madrid shirt, but uh, <laughs> I thought this one would, would be a little better. Really, less uh, problems. But, well, it's also, I, I love these shirts yeah. because if you ever feel fat, just buy some hockey shirts and you, you never feel fat in one of these things. So they're wonderful for that. Yeah, it's good. Really interesting. Yeah. I'm watching the Q&A over here to see if there's no, anything. Have, no. Don't be shy. I'm happy to answer almost anything. I want to say thank you in the chat. No question by now. Oh. Are you going to be here later in case they want to talk with you in the tables? Absolutely. Yeah, no, I'll be at the tables. And, uh, you know, if there was anything missed uh, due to the, the technical troubles with the platform, uh, you know, I'm happy to recap anything. And I'll definitely be around for the next hour probably in the chat room. Ah, so it's good. So remember that you can go to the tables and you can chat with the people. And we have a question here. What do you think about the Parrot OS? Um, I haven't had much experience with it, but I'm always open to trying new ones. Uh, the, the typical thing for me that I would ask would just be uh, what would be the reason to use it? And I just, I'm not familiar with why Parrot, why I would use that, especially uh, as opposed to Kali or Raspbian in particular. On general systems, I'm a huge fan of Red Hat Enterprise Linux and CentOS um, are my two go-to, but, you know, obviously very familiar with other systems Ubuntu and Debian based as well as Red Hat based uh, systems. Uh, a lot of that's because when I was uh, first learning Linux, um, I, or Unix, excuse me, I started on uh, largely on Solaris based systems. And so Red Hat was an easy path to learning uh, Red Hat. Okay. Any other questions you can ask? Otherwise, you can go to the tables. Remember in the tables, you can put your camera and your micro on and you can chat with the people in your table and you can change from one table to another, chat with different people. Oh. Sorry, we don't have, we yeah. don't have. Because, uh, yeah, and I believe that, <coughs> excuse me, the main difference between Kali and Parrot is uh, really kind of just in the desktop interface, which is, uh, I believe it's uh, GNOME versus um, what's called Matt. Um, interface. And uh, that, to me, isn't really that big a deal. I use the command line interface almost exclusively. So uh, in fact, I tell people, if you want to become a, a really, really good uh, pen tester and, and uh, administrator, the CLI is your friend, the command line interface, you've got to learn it. Okay. Remember, you can write the questions in the Q&A. I think you explained it really good because we don't have many questions. It is great. <laughs> Everyone understood. But this is good. So you have any more questions? We can go to the networking. Thank you again, Kevin. It was really nice to have you here. Thank you, Emma. 
nice to be here. Thank you so much. I'll uh, I'll be in the Q and A room up to the top right uh, if you guys specifically want, and I'll stay there for fifteen minutes or so, and then I'll jump to a couple of tables if I see anybody. So, Alonzo, thank you for the one question. If you were at a face to face conference with me, you're usually the person I would give a prize to for being brave and asking yeah. a question. Okay, thank you very much again, Kibi. See you later in the Bye, table. Everybody. So yes, you can go now to the table. You can check in different rooms and enjoy the networking time.